independent in thought, and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. And my name is Greg Knapp. How you doing? I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. You can jump in at 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD. Ton of stuff to talk about today. I mean, it's just, you would think, oh, it's slow. It's the summer. There's nothing. No, no, no. There's plenty to talk about. We'll get into everything going on with the Russian investigation, uh, with Brennan and his security clearance. We'll talk about what's going on with immigration and customs. And f- Did you see that ICE went after a, a, a an illegal alien who was driving his pregnant wife to the hospital? I mean, it's outrageous. Well, you got to know the whole story. We'll talk about a police department that doesn't want you to record them anymore in public. Wait, uh, but... Why would they not want you to do that? Uh, We'll get to all of it. But I wanted to start with something a little bit different. Because I see stories like this, and they really start to freak me out. I'm not talking about the video of the lifelike robot walking around on the Internet today, although that's a little freaky deaky too. But I'm talking about people who are being chipped. What do you mean? What's chipped? What are you talking? You know, the little RFID chips that are used to do inventory and other things in stores, well, people are now getting them implanted in their skin. You know, if you spread your hand and you look at that skin between your thumb and your forefinger, that little web of skin there, they just implant a little chip, a little rice-sized RFID chip right under your skin there. You don't even notice it. And all of a sudden, life becomes so much more convenient. And this is the follow-up story. It was a year ago that this started, and I talked about it. And now it's been a year at this company that embeds microchips and its employees. Technolo- Technology Review has a story out today. And it says, when Patrick McMullen wants a diet Dr. Pepper while he's at work, he pays for it with a wave of his hand. He has a microchip implanted between his thumb and forefinger. And the vending machine immediately deducts money from his account. I mean, see, why wouldn't you want to be chipped if you can do that? I mean, what's a little worry about, you know, uh, microchipping under your skin for the convenience of having a Diet Dr. Pepper deducted from your account with the wave of a hand? (laughs) Would you do this? Three Square Market is the name of the company. McMullen's the president. A year ago, 50 employees volunteered to be chipped. 30 more have volunteered since that date. So 80 of the of, of the of 80 members of the of the company have volunteered to be chipped. I wonder what happens if you don't volunteer and you work there. Oh, nothing. We don't really. You don't think since the president and the vice president are chipped that if you don't quote volunteer to be chipped, it may not hurt your prospects for promotion. Maybe a little, you know, but you know, you guys heard about Dale, didn't you? No, what's going on with Dale? Dale says he'll never be chipped. Dale doesn't want to be chipped? Well, you know, it's a voluntary thing. Oh, I understand, but Dale's not going to be chipped? No, he's not a team player. Not a team player, Dale. Not being chipped. I don't know. I mean, how do you know that it's not going to hurt your rip? Here's my, my question to get us started today. Would you be chipped? Would you volunteer to be chipped? Because I know some people go, no way, I would never be chipped. I'm never going to let my privacy go out the window like that. But think about what we're already doing. That if I'd asked you 20 years ago, you would have said not just no, but hell no. Here's the question. Would you volunteer to carry a device around with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that would allow people to track you with GPS? You say, no, I would never volunteer for that. Do you have a smartphone in your pocket right now? Because you're doing it. Every smartphone that is, I, when did they do this? At least five or six years ago. I can't remember the exact date they started doing this. But every new smartphone has GPS tracking in it. So if you're carrying your phone and it's turned on, which all of us do all the time, then we are voluntarily allowing ourselves to be tracked via GPS. And I say, well, they're not tracking me. I'm nobody. Who cares? I, you know, but they could if they wanted to. Who's they? Well, government, private entity, whoever could have access to that. I'm sure some of it would take some hacking. But, you know, it's kind of like when Director of National Intelligence Clapper was in front of the Congressional Committee and he was asked if 
the NSA was gathering any any information on us at all. I said, no, 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 they're not. Yeah, they were. All your metadata. <laughs> I'm sure no, you're not being tracked with a GPS until they want to, until they believe they need to. And we're voluntarily carrying it around in our pocket. Honey, it's the conspiracy guy. Get the tinfoil hats out. I know it sounds kind of weird, but you just think about it. Would you ever have thought you would voluntarily do that? And think about the apps you put on your phone. You know when it lists that whole agreement, you know, by clicking here, you will agree to this and that and the other. And Do you ever even read through it anymore? No, you just click yes because you want the free app. You don't care that it's tracking your movements. You don't care that it's tracking your purchases on Amazon. You don't care what it's doing. You just want the free app. For that little bit of convenience, we're willing to say, sure, click here. We don't even read it. I know I don't. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm above this. I don't either. I want my free app. I just click, yes, I agree. Let's go. Come on. Hurry up. That's all if we want it, man. I'm carrying the phone. I know that I can be tracked 24-7 with GPS technology now, but I'm like, eh. <laughs> so what's the difference between being chipped? Because, hey, if I can get my Diet Dr. Pepper faster, if I don't have to get the quarters out of my pocket, or if I don't have to swipe the credit card, or I don't, for a little bit of inconvenience on my, you know, one time I get chipped, and then I'm, eh. Would you do it? Would you do it right now? I mean, we already say yes to being tracked with our cookies on our computer. No, I have a way around that. Eh, probably not. I'm sure there's a way around your way around. But people love these, the chips that, that McMullen and his employees got, about the size of a large grain of rice. They're intended to make it a little easier to do things like get into the office, log on to the computers, buy food and drinks in the company cafeteria, give away all their medical history. I, I no, that's, that's not part of it, I'm sure. Uh, it all depends on what you put in there. Now, the RFID chips, they don't take any uh, energy to work. It's the RFID reader. As you get close to the reader, then it's activated and it's able to read what's on the chip and able to open the door or not or charge your account or not. But how far does it go and how much are we willing to put on those chips? McMullen, the president of the company, says, you know, you get used to it. It's easy. He only has 250 employees. About a third of them are now chipped. Software engineer of the company says he uses his chip 10 to 15 times a day. He said, it's really no different from typing in my password on a keyboard. I just wave it over the top. And who wouldn't want to, you know, get chips so they don't have to remember all their passwords anymore? I mean, that's getting crazy. Nick Anderson is an associate professor in public health sciences, University of California, Davis. Says, yes, privacy and security are concerns on this. No, really? The information gathered by the readers could give lots of details about employees' comings and goings. Of course, every time you go through the door, someone could, in theory, ping your chip with a reader to find out what's on it. Yeah, and it depends on how much information is placed on it. I mean, right now, a lot of people have this with a key card. You put the key card in your wallet. It tracks you when you get in the office, when you get out of the office. Many offices, it'll track you when you go into the bathroom and you come out of the bathroom. In fact, there are people who are getting in trouble for being in the bathroom too long because they're wasting time at the office. There are people who are delivery drivers, and their car truck is on GPS, and it shows their boss exactly how long it took them to get from point A to point B and where they went in between point A and point B. And, you know, hey, that that's something that they have a right to do because it's their truck. But when they chip you... As a person, now aren't we going to a whole other level? So does that bother you? 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD, and would you do it? Right now, I'm still at the point where I would say no. I don't want to be chipped. And we haven't even gotten into the religious aspect of this. Uh, a lot of people would say this is exactly what they were talking about with the you know 666 and sign of the devil and all this. You know, Sure, you can get to the religious part of it too, but I mean, even if you leave that part out of it, is there something that creeps you out about having a microchip embedded into you and all that that entails? Or, hey, when you get enough convenience, it's worth it. If you didn't have to lug your wallet around anymore, would it be worth it to you? If, if you could just wave your hand and pay for anything, if you could wave your hand and have your ID checked, if you could wave your hand and... Do all your passwords. If you could wave your hand to get into your office, if, if that's all it takes, would it be worth it to you? And right now, these people are saying yes. I, 
Right now I'm saying no, but I bet there's something that could be offered to me that would make it a yes. And it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. 844 Dick Chad. Here's another one that goes along with our high technology. Amazon. Amazon is number one in the cloud business. It's it's dominating the cloud business right now. Amazon. I, I thought it would be Microsoft or Google or, or something like that, but according to uh, Maya Frazier at Bloomberg, Amazon is dominating America's cloud business. It's gone from non-existent to using 2% of U.S. electricity in about a decade. 2% of all of our electricity goes to the cloud. But I thought all these high-tech companies were big-time environmental groups. I guess they're, you know, they're creating global warming all by themselves now. Well, there's a story today by, by Maya Fraser in Bloomberg, and she's saying uh, Amazon is getting sweetheart deals for this electricity in city after city, state after state. She talks about in Gainesville, Virginia, there's a line that is running along a nearby highway that the utility, Dominion Energy, Inc., has agreed to bury because the citizens wanted them to bury it instead of having it you know, uh, be another big eyesore. It costs about $172 million, and the utility and state legislators are passing that cost on to the taxpayers. The state's House of Delegates approved the proposal to raise the money for Amazon's line with as a yet unannounced amount in a monthly fee. So wait a second. So Amazon gets the line they want, the new infrastructure. They get it paid for by the taxpayer. They're getting huge tax breaks from the state and the city. And it looks like they may be getting free electricity as well. Well, maybe not free electric. Well, I want to get you the details on this and see if you think this is the right way to go. And then you won't believe what Stevie Wonder is blaming Aretha Franklin's death on. It's a little weird. We got the audio. It's all coming up. My name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad Benson on the Chad Benson Show. Take a fake news break. Check, 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 check out the really important news of the day at our website, chadbensonshow.com. Once there, click on Chad's free podcast and get real. The Chad Benson Show, where truth and the American way live. Print free. Hey, how you doing? My name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. You can join in at 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD. Get you on board. We've got a couple things out here. Number one, a year into this chipping plan at, at, at the three market, I think it's called. I'm going to make sure I get the right name of this company here. I'm going to be in trouble. Three square market, three square market. 80 of the 250 employees have volunteered to be chipped. Because, hey, uh, you wave it over your computer, it's your password. You wave at the vending machine, it pays for your diet, Dr. Pepper. You wave it over the little thing near the door, and you can get in and out of the locked doors. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Except, of course, you're chipped now. It's, like, embedded into your body. Well, you know, it's just a little inconvenience for a lot of convenience. So would you do that? And if not, I wonder how long before we all say yes. And then Bloomberg has this piece, and the headline is, Amazon isn't paying its electric bills, you might be. And it gets down into what's been going on here, and it says it's kind of a pattern. Amazon Web Services is the cloud computing business for Amazon, and it is growing like crazy, and it takes a lot of infrastructure. But over the past two years, Amazon has almost doubled the size of its physical footprint worldwide, 254 million square feet. Wow. Dozens of new data centers. Their servers are running 24-7 in at least two states. It's negotiated with the utilities and the politicians and stuck other people with the bills. We don't even know how much because they don't have to be transparent and everything. We don't know how many millions of dollars are being subsidized by the people who live in these states for Amazon. They've gotten about $1.2 billion in state and municipal tax incentives over the past decade to put more servers and uh, uh, what do you call a, a, a store? Not stores. They don't have stores. What do you call it? Uh, warehouses and whatever. Cloud areas, server space, tax breaks. I understand, but cost shifting. That's a whole nother level. Cause if you weren't getting tax money here anyway, why not say, okay, for a few years, we're still not going to collect tax from you. 
uh, so that you'll come here. Okay, I can see that. But the rest of this is corporate welfare. It's using 2% of the U.S. electricity market now. The cloud business. Wow, that's amazing. And then we get to why you don't know how much of this money is really being paid for by the taxpayer. Because they say, unlike tax incentives, which you have to disclose the, to the public, the costs of electricity deals can remain hidden because they're really technically between companies. But they do have to be approved by state regulators. Huh. Now, these data centers typically don't really bring that many new jobs to an area, but they bring some. And they bring some tax dollars, I guess, eventually. Now, they talk about it in Virginia. Amazon has uh, Vadata Inc. believed to operate at least 29 data centers, planning 11 more. And there are two versions of their application, a heavily redacted public one and another one under seal with state regulators. And they're, they're negotiating rate discounts with these power companies, and they don't have to disclose what the rate discount is. And in Ohio, where they're doing this, they received $77 million in tax incentives for three data centers in 2016. And last year, Amazon said, hey, we'll put 12 more in there if you reduce our electricity rates. And the American Electric Power in Ohio exempted Amazon from surcharges that other Ohioans must pay. In other words, since Amazon isn't paying for it, somebody's got to. That means it's going to be shifted to the regular taxpayer. And we don't even know how many because it's not being made public. Wow. Does that seem right to you? Kind of seems like a little corporate welfare, doesn't it? 844-DIG-CHAD. I would love to know your thoughts on that one. And Stevie Wonder, good friend of Aretha Franklin, the last time he went to visit her in the hospital, she couldn't even speak. He was very distraught over her death. And he went and talked on CBS this morning. And, you know, you could tell he was he was very upset. And then he got into why he thinks Aretha Franklin died and why he thinks there's so many more diseases lately in the world wait till you hear what he said we'll get to that in a little bit in just a minute and then on to the russian collusion case and all the latest details my name is greg knapp in for chad benson the chad benson show Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. My name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. 844-DIG-CHAD and you're on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAD. You can also go to thechadshow.com online. Over on the right-hand side, we have the icons for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So you can jump in and be part of that with Chad as well. Stevie Wonder, very distraught. His good friend, Aretha Franklin, passing away. Love Aretha's music. I love Stevie Wonder's music. I don't know that I'm going to Stevie Wonder, though, for information on science. So Stevie Wonder said, you know, there may be a reason that Aretha Franklin died beyond her disease, because there may be something that pushed her disease. Listen to cut two of Stevie Wonder. I just feel that all these various diseases that we have and all these things that are happening in the world, in part... It's because there are those who don't believe in global warming, don't believe that what we do affects the world, what we eat affects the world, uh, and affects us. Uh, wait, so I feel that all these various diseases that we have and all that is happening in the world, in part, is because there are those who don't believe in global warming. So wait a second, is it because the people who don't believe in global warming are causing the diseases or are you saying global warming is causing the diseases and if people would believe in that maybe we do something about it i i'm going to be charitable and say i think it's the latter that he's really trying to convey and we just needs to work on his grammar and syntax a little bit but really so aretha franklin didn't die from the disease she has she died because global warming gave her the disease she has and if you don't believe that, well, you're part of the problem, Buster. Now, once again, we're conflating the idea of if, if somebody even questions that global warming isn't as severe and man-made as we're being told it is, you're a denier. Now, of course, science is always supposed to be looking for new information. 
if you actually look at the satellite data on our temperatures, which is more accurate than ground temperature because ground temperature has heat sinks and asphalt and cities and all kinds of other things. The satellite data shows that we haven't had any warming for about 17 years. When they keep telling you this is the warmest year on record, it's within the margin of error of the problem anyway. When you talk about ice is melting here, ice is growing over here. I mean, there, there, there are all kinds of conflicting data. If you look at the actual global warming climate models, they've been wrong, 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 wrong. And when you try to use those models to predict past climate, which we know, they get it wrong, 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 wrong. So who's following the science and who's following a belief? Because the science shows that the people who believe in, quote, climate change now, because they couldn't go along with global warming anymore since it stopped warming, are the ones who are just believing instead of relying on the data. I'm not saying that this planet has not warmed. It has. And it's cooled. And it's warmed. And it's cooled. And it's warmed. The question is, how much does man impact it? And could we really do anything about it to a significant degree based on what people like Stevie Wonder and Al Gore want us to do and where that money might be better used to serve humanity, including something like just clean drinking water? Because even if the planet is warming, it's been warmer before. All you have to do is look at our history. Look, in England, there are streets named after grapes because it used to be warm enough to grow grapes to make wine there. We know that the planet's been warmer than it is today in our past. So, But Stevie Wonder says it's all about, you know, because of global warming, that's what's causing all these diseases that killed Aretha Franklin. And if you don't believe that, well, let's hear cut three. I just hope that people will grow up and grow out of the foolishness and know that we all, by how we think, how we do, how we treat others, Uh, We will never unlock the key until we truly uh, let go of the hatred, the the bigotry, the evilness, the selfishness. When we do that, then we can unlock some of those things that uh, keep us in this place. Okay, I, I, I totally agree that we should let go of hatred, bigotry, evilness, and selfishness. The rest of it, I don't quite understand the key he's talking about. And I listened to the whole interview, and I, it's a little all over the place. But, you know, hey... Uh, I hope that people will grow up out of the foolishness and I, and I, you know, like not believing in global warming and just quit killing Aretha Franklin. Okay. Thank you, Stevie. 844 Dig Chad, get you on board the program. 844 Dig Chad. Yeah. He said, anyone who believes that there's no such thing as global warming must be blind or unintelligent. I, I don't think Stevie should use blind that way. I mean, he used it as a derogatory term. Come on, Stevie. I think that's, you're being a blindist. The man's blind. He can do it if he wants to. But that gives you the, oh, I, because he's blind, he can make the joke about the, oh, okay. Thank you. I Thanks for pointing that out to me. And then we get into some crazy audio. A couple pieces of going after Trump, which will t- lead us right into the whole Trump-Russian collusion investigation update, because every day it's something new. But let's start with Florida Democratic Representative Alcee Hastings. Now, He is a guy that has not said very many nice things about Trump, of course. He was giving a little talk at a rally in Sunshine, Florida, and he repeated a joke that he had heard from Ari Silver, the son of former Florida State legislator Barry Silver. Here's the joke he told the crowd, Alcee Hastings. But Ari asked the audience the other night in Palm Beach County, he said, do you know the difference between a crisis and a catastrophe? And no one held their hand, so Ari answered for us. He says, a crisis is if Donald Trump falls into the Potomac uh, River and can't swim. And he says, and a catastrophe is anybody saves his ass. <laughs> Hold on. No. <laughs> it's a very old joke. You just keep putting in a different person's name. But the... Double standard is just so huge here. Just imagine a Republican telling that joke with the name President Obama in there instead of President Trump in the second year of his reign. What do you mean his reign? Okay, I'm sorry, his administration. The press would be going nuts. 
The press would be calling that Republican a racist and every other name you could think of and somebody that was just, you know, destroying the civility of our politics, somebody that needed to rise above this, somebody that didn't deserve to have this office. I haven't seen the condemnation on L.C. Hastings of you. Oh, no, it's okay. It's okay to make the because you see, of course, it would be an awful, horrible joke to tell about President Obama. And of course, it would be racist if you told it about President Obama. But a black representative telling that joke about a white president, there's no way that's racist, of course, because, you know, that's just not even the definition of racist. It, it, no, you, you can't have it that way. And and because Trump is Trump, it's OK to make that joke about him because really he deserves to die. I mean, you got to understand how this works. And it moves us on to The New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg. She was on MSNBC's Meet the Press Daily on Friday. And it, it, let me set up what was going on here. They're talking about President Trump. Real Clear Politics reporter Caitlin Huey Burns is on, and she's criticizing Trump's communication strategy. And she said, you know, he's the leader of the free world. And and Michelle Goldberg from The New York Times interjected and said, no, he's not. He's not the free leader of the free world. Sorry. It's actually German Chancellor Angela Mar- Merkel. Angela Merkel. Merkel. Excuse me. Come on, Greg. Can you talk today? And he's not the leader of the free world. Huh? No. Merkel is the leader of the free world. Well, he's the most important person in the world in politics right now, says Huey Burns. And then Katie Turr asks, what do you mean about him not being the leader of the free world? And Michelle Goldberg tries to explain. You'll hear Katie Turr jump in. You'll hear um, John Potterts from New York Post jump in. But just listen to how New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg describes President Trump, cut seven. He's, right. a, he's a sort of junior player in a block of authoritarian countries. And no, and the people like the European Union are no longer looking at him as a leader any longer. And they're thinking of, of course not. They see him as, right, they see him, he's instead, he's like, right, he's part of a block that includes Vladimir Putin, Duterte. He's, you know, he's kind of part so, of a, he, he's part of kind of an axis that's, power. That's, of, well, hold on. That that's, worse. Uh, that's, it's, it's worse than putting that him, in a certain I mean, way. I mean, not that that's not the worst thing you could have said, because it's about <laughs> the worst thing you could say about him. But well, if he's, he's not, not he's the leader rounding the people up and murdering America. murdering them yeah. without any uh, you know yeah. due process. He'd certainly yeah. like to. Uh, what? Uh, well, anyway, I, 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 what did you? Did, wait, there's so much here. So first, the New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg is saying that Trump is part of a block of Vladimir Putin and Duterte from the Philippines. Both Duterte and Putin have been accused of murdering their own people. Murdering them. And here's the New York Times columnist saying, oh, yeah, President Trump's just like that. Really? So even Katie Turr on MSNBC has to say, well, now, hold on now. Uh, Trump is not rounding up and murdering them without any due. Trump is not rounding people up and murdering them without any due process. I mean, at least he'd give them due process. Trump is not rounding up anybody. Well, he's rounding up the illegal aliens the same way that. President Obama rounded up illegal aliens and President Bush did illegal aliens. You know, it's kind of the law. No, he's doing it different. But the 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 Goldberg Goldberg, the uh, New York Times columnist says he would certainly like to. So Goldberg thinks that President Trump would like to round people up and kill them. I, how do you even talk to the people like that? Could again, could you imagine if a columnist said that about President Obama, well, nobody would because he wasn't doing. Cra- who who was who um who was going after reporters to arrest them? Um, who was using the IRS to go after groups of people that were conservative in their ideology? Who is it that ran guns to Mexico? Uh, who is it that lied to us about our people being killed in Benghazi? No, no, no. It's it's uh, we can't talk about Obama that way. I mean, Trump is that way. I mean, he just he liked to kill people. Wow. Wow. I don't the the hatred, the 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 Trump derangement syndrome is off the rails. And that leads us to the way the press is handling the latest information on the Russian collusion situation. And Holman Jenkins had a great piece on this that came out 
Saturday. And he said, look, there's there's two huge stories on the whole Russian story and only one's being covered. I've talked about this for a year and a half now, but it's nice to see, you know, someone at a big newspaper like the Wall Street Journal point this out. There are two big stories about Russia. Only one of them is being covered. And the reason is the other one might make the newspapers and the mainstream media look like they're actually giving Trump a fair shake and might look bad for the last administration and for Hillary Clinton. And we can't have that. We'll talk about that in just a second. 844-DIG-CHAD, get you in. My name's Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad Benson on The Chad Benson Show. Punk this punk rocker any time of the day or night. Reach Chad on Twitter at Chad Benson Show and on Instagram at Chad Benson Show. And oh yeah, the Chad Benson Show on Facebook too. Punk that. My name is Greg Knapp in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. 844 Dig Chad gets you in. 844 Dig Chad. And we're doing the Russian collusion investigation update because every day there's something new. And the big thing from the Saturday New York Times story was White House counsel Don McGahn has cooperated extensively in the Mueller inquiry. And they made it seem like he flipped on the president, but we understand he did 30 hours of interviews and that President Trump waived executive privilege and attorney-client privilege, which is virtually unheard of. And it doesn't look like he flipped on President Trump at all. It looked like he was just cooperating with Mueller to the point that there's no reason to even interview president trump as andrew mccarthy former federal prosecutor puts it he said i've been arguing for months the president shouldn't even be asked to submit to questioning until the prosecutor establishes one the president is implicated in a serious crime which nobody has has actually uh, established yet and number two that the president would have information or evidence the prosecutor is unable to obtain from any other source because that's what you have to prove before a sitting president gets interviewed in a situation like this And now that they've given 30 hours of his attorney, his presidential attorney, not his personal attorney, but his presidential attorney, to the investigation, doesn't look like there's a need. And it also ties in to what Holman Jenkins wrote in the Saturday Wall Street Journal. He says the press abets a cover-up. And what he's talking about is there are two stories going on with this whole Russian collusion thing. The one is the story of the hacking of the dnc and and who did that and intercepted russian intelligence document that was pivotal in james Comey's um unprecedented and possibly even decisive actions according to the democrats in in to intervene in the presidential race and some say it was false some say it was planned by the russians some say it was accurate and it was actually showing off this illegal conspiracy to obstruct justice by the clinton campaign and the obama attorney general loretta lynch so you got that going on, but then you got the Steele dossier. And the question is, who were the alleged Russian sources behind it and what were their motives? And you think about what's really going on here. Here's, here's what that Steele dossier was. A foreign citizen, Steele, producing a catalog of unverifiable, scandalous accusations against a U.S. presidential candidate attributed to unnamed Russian officials, paid for by the candidate of the party in power. Her Confederates, including elected Democrats, conspired to use the FBI's possession of that document to get U.S. media outlets to report the allegations from sources who won't identify themselves, who offer no support for their claims, passed along by an operator whose political motives are manifest. That's from Holman Jenkins. And he's right. You, you, you go right down that. It's like, wow, isn't that a pretty big story? And that's not the one that's being talked about. Why aren't both? What? What? I have no problem with finding out. All right, who exactly? What Russians hacked the DNC? Did anybody help them do it? Did anybody help them leak the document? That's all fine. And and who planted the story about uh, Hillary Clinton and and uh, sure, but what about who were the alleged Russian sources behind the Steele dossier? Why were these FISA warrants given out with this kind of information? when the judges didn't even know who was paying for it. 
I mean, you look at this, and he says, if you're not by now open to the suspicion that the blowhardism of former Obama intelligence officials John Brennan and James Clapper is aimed at keeping the focus away from their actions during the election, you haven't been paying attention. I mean, Brennan actually says the main reason he believed in Russian collusion was the joke that Trump told about Hillary's emails that, hey, if the Russians get them, I sure hope they put them out there. That's it? So Holman Jenkins says, when Trump tweets and blurts out so many offhand things, are you really going to build a treason case, the term Brennan used, out of just another free-form Trump campaign riff of 2016? And brings us to the press. The two stories are both legitimate, pressing interests, but editors and reporters say to themselves, might not looking into these matters be construed as pro-Trump? We can't have that. Not one paper. Despite lavish coverage of the DOJ Inspector General's report, even noted the existence of a secret appendix. And he goes on. It's good stuff. Why aren't we getting all these stories covered equally? What do you think? 844 Dig Chad, get you on board. My name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad Benson. This is The Chad Benson Show. This is The Chad Benson Show. in thoughts and punk rock in life it's the chad benson show and my name is greg knapp i'm in for chad on the chad benson show you can jump in at 844 dig chad 844 dig chad and you're in the chad show.com online on the right hand side you got facebook twitter instagram click on those and you're right in there with chad so you can converse with him i want to start this hour with just just how bias the media is and what it reports and i know that's not going to surprise you but i mean i saw this over the weekend and if you actually read the entire article when it first came out you would have known what you needed to know to pump the brakes on the outrage but people on the far left that hate this president with a fervor don't want the context here was the headline from cbs la ICE detains man driving pregnant wife to deliver baby. I mean, I saw the hell. Oh, man, this is going to be outrageous. So this woman was in labor. She's on the way. The cops probably pulled the guy over because he was speeding. And you find out that, hey, this guy's illegal. Well, at least let him go to the hospital and have the baby and then take him. Right? Nope, they took him right then. And the woman had to drive herself to the hospital. Wow, this is unbelievable. And so the tweets come fast and furious, saying things like, this is monstrous. Um, You had the New York Times, the pregnant woman had to drive herself to the hospital for her C-section after oh wait it was a C-section after U.S. immigration arrest her husband when they stopped at a gas station we had Amy Siskin um, tweeting out uh, a new baby boy is without I'm sorry OMFG ICE detained a husband as he was driving his wife for a C-section she had to drive herself to the hospital the cruelty and inhumanity of this regime you had John Farveau from the Obama administration. This is monstrous and on and on, right? But then you get down to the story. The rest of the headline. ICE detains man driving pregnant wife to deliver baby. Says he is wanted for a homicide in Mexico. Wait, homicide? You mean he wasn't just here to get a job? Wait, does that change the story a little? No. Well, let's let's learn a little bit more. We find out the Mexican authorities have now confirmed there is a murder warrant out for this man. Joel Arona Lara came into the country illegally from Mexico, as did his wife, by the way, 12 years ago. The woman now has five children. They're all U.S. citizens because they were born here. But she's here illegally. Probably could have arrested her, too. Well, but see, they didn't. Because that would have been cruel. She was on her way for a scheduled cesarean section. So 
she wasn't in labor? No. It wasn't an emergency? No. So do you think maybe the Immigration and Customs Enforcement officer said, are you able to drive yourself to the hospital or do you need some help? Don't know because nobody covered that. I would bet you that they did. If she told them, hey, we're on our way to the hospital, do you need someone to come help you? Do you want us to call you an ambulance? Could that have happened? So scheduled cesarean section, not an emergency, and they had been contacted. ICE had been contacted by Mexico to be on the lookout for this guy. Now, of course, the wife wants to defend her husband, so she told anybody who would listen that her husband had never been wanted by law enforcement, that that he had never done anything wrong, that he'd never even been stopped for a traffic ticket. But the Mexican authorities are confirming the existence of the murder warrant, that he was wanted for, quote, intentional homicide. That's the equivalent of murder in Mexico. In the Mexican state of Guanajuato, this is reporting by Will Rackey. Uh, the AP reported that Monday as well. So they, they said there was a state official who told the AP that, yes, this man's wanted for murder. And that the Mexican prosecutors had asked U.S. authorities to help locate and detain Arona Lara. Oh. Well, that's a little different. Yeah, ICE said Mr. Arona Lara was brought to ICE's attention due to an outstanding warrant for his arrest in Mexico on homicide charges. That's ICE spokeswoman Lori Haley. The main concern uh, here is this woman, right? And how dare you arrest her husband when they're on the way to the... The man was arrested for attempted... Excuse me, for murder, not attempted murder. He was arrested for murder. Now, some of the these uh, mainstream media outlets are correcting their stories, but they haven't corrected their tweets. I mean, how dare you? How could you possibly do that in a GoFundMe account? A GoFundMe account now has raised thousands of dollars for this man who's accused of murder in Mexico. Well, you know, you know it's all about Trump, really. It's just, if Trump, to be as monstrous as he is to to pick up a man who's driving his wife to the hospital how could you possibly do that did you miss the part where he's accused of murder well that doesn't matter come on this is just outrageous that anybody would do such a thing what do you think 844 dig chad gets you on board the program 844 dig chad meanwhile president trump is honoring the border patrol officer who saved dozens of illegal aliens yes you can you can view illegal aliens as human beings who deserve compassion and deserve to be treated humanely and also believe that we have to enforce our laws. I don't want anybody dying crossing into this country. I don't want anybody treated unfairly and inhumanely. But I also want our laws enforced. And these, these ICE officers and these Border Patrol officers, they don't just arrest Illegal aliens, they assist them with food and water and making sure that they are in good medical shape. The Customs and Border Patrol agent Adrian Anzaldua discovered 78 illegal aliens locked in a refrigerator trailer back on August the 11th. And Trump called the agent up to the podium and joked that he didn't know we were going to do this, but I wanted to ask you about that. 78 lives. You saved 78 people. How did you feel that there were that many people in that trailer? And the agent thanked the president for calling him to the podium and explained how he observed a truck that fled a Border Patrol checkpoint after a canine triggered the alert. He said, I opened the little latch on the back of the tractor trailer, and it revealed a lot of subjects. I quickly asked for backup. Backup got there. The suspects were transported back to the checkpoint. All of them were then in good health. This is very dangerous to have people trying to get into the country this way. How many people have died crossing the desert? How many people have died coming from China in the container ships? I mean, the situation is very, very dangerous for the people coming here and the people trying to protect our border. And then there are the people who are just overstaying their visas. 
This is one by uh, uh, Washington Free Beacon. And they said more than 700,000 people overstayed their visas in 2017. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. You realize about 40% of the illegal aliens in this country right now are people who just overstayed their visas. 600,000 of these individuals are suspected to have stayed in the country. The other 100,000 or so finally have gone back home. But there's about 53 million people who are admitted to the United States every year for all kinds of reasons. So only 700,000 overstayed their their visa. I mean, it's really not that much. That's a lot. 700,000 and 600,000 are still here. So over half a million every year that are just staying here illegally, plus the ones that come across the border illegally, and you can't figure out why people are upset about this. Visa overstays have become a priority. But they aren't able to stop them all. Now, they haven't published country-by-country measures on how many temporary visa holders are currently in the country, but they did provide a rough proxy. The number of temporary visa holders expected to, to depart in fiscal year 2017. Major European and Asian allies like the UK, Japan, and Germany have the most people. Then there's China and India. And now there's one caveat to this. It only counts sea and air arrivals, not people entering over land. So Canada and Mexico are not listed in this report. But it just shows you just how bad this problem is that we're finally trying to get a handle on. 844-DIG-CHAD gets you on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAD gets you in. And there's a couple more stories here on the whole illegal alien problem. Is it back to school time for illegal aliens? And a judge now has come out and said, wait a second, we don't have to accept new so-called dreamer requests. We'll hit that in just a second and take your phone calls as well. My name is Greg Knapp in for Chad Benson on the Chad Benson Show. Bird in the Hand is worth 140 on Twitter, so tweet your beak off at Chad Benson Show Twitter. And if instant gratification is your thing, hit Chad up on Instagram at Chad Benson. Your bird will thank you. And my name is Greg Knapp. I am in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. We're talking about just how biased the reporting is on some of this stuff, like the illegal immigrant situation over the weekend, the big headline. Illegal immigrant, uh, well, they don't, they don't say it that way. Man, arrested and held by ICE while driving his pregnant wife to the hospital. And then you find out, well, it was, it was a scheduled C-section. It wasn't an emergency, and he was detained because the Mexican government had asked us to go after this man because he's wanted for murder in Mexico. Yeah, well... She still had to drive herself to the hospital. You know, she came into the United States illegally as well. Well, so, well, they didn't arrest her. <laughs> 700,000 visa overstays in fiscal year 2017. 600,000 still here. But, you, but hey, there's nothing wrong with our system. Everything's fine. We should just do away with borders and do away with the law. That's all, That would take care of all of it. Be no problem whatsoever. And then we say, okay, what are we doing with the the children who came in Ill- illegally that we've been talking about? And they're being held in different shelters across America. Well, the Associated Press did a story where they're looking at the school districts in 61 cities nationwide where these shelters are known to exist. And among the 50 that responded, most said they had no contact with the shelter or federal program authorities. Now, the reason that's important is that the law says that if a child applies to be educated in a school district in which it lives, that that child must be given that public education even if that child is there illegally, that they're not even allowed to ask about their immigration status. Well, there's one district, San Benito, Texas, where they are trying to educate every single child in the shelter. Dozens of bilingual teachers. 
They're putting out mobile classroom units because they have hundreds of children in the detention center near them, and they want to serve them, but it's a big strain on the school district. But the questions are, do they have, to, have they really applied to that school? Because these other school districts are like, we're not doing anything yet because nobody's applied. One of the superintendents of the Oracle Arizona School District said this, until this becomes a real-time issue for us, we have no official position. Now, we will educate all children regardless of immigration status as required by law if their families or legal guardians seek enrollment on their campuses. Well, there's a problem here because uh, the majority of these children, most, here's what the AP says, quote, most of the thousands of young people held in the federal shelters across the United States are unaccompanied minors. Most of them came into the United States without an adult. And now they're in a shelter without an adult. They weren't separated by Trump. They were separated by their own family sending them. And so they don't have an adult yet to even try to enroll them in school. Oh, this is, what a mess. What a mess. And, and then it brings us up to the U.S. District Judge John Bates, who's kind of all over the place with his rulings on the so-called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Well, really, that's what it's called, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It's the so-called DREAM Act that President Obama put through which he had said time and time and time again he didn't have the power to do, and then he just did it, went around Congress writing his own law, even when Congress wouldn't go along with what he'd wanted them to do to begin with, including many of his own Democrats. He just made it up on his own, and the judges have allowed it so far. And so Trump comes along and goes, all right, it was an executive order to start it. I'm going to do an executive order to stop it. And we have judges going, no, you can't do that. Wait, wait, if one president has the power to start it, Then another president has the power to stop it. So what you're saying is President Obama, who really didn't have the power to start it, but since it started, you can't stop it. What? Well, he's kind of backpedaled a little bit. Now we've got the U.S. District Judge John Bates saying the government does not have to accept new deferred action for childhood arrival requests. That's going back on his first order back on August the 3rd. The AP reporting that no new requests will be processed. And the judge delayed on providing special protections to the DACA recipients. And according to the Washington Times Saturday report, government officials saying more than 100,000 new DACA applications and 30,000 advanced parole requests. That means you can go outside of America and come back without a problem would occur if DACA were completely rebooted. And that would put a big strain on U.S. Customs. And they can't do it. So Bates feared that, and he feared confusion by restarting this program. Although he still says the illegal alien children are having their rights withheld. Quote, because that confusion will only be magnified if the court's order regarding the initial DACA applications were to take effect now and later be reversed on appeal, the court will grant a limited stay of its order and preserve the status quo pending appeal, as plaintiffs themselves suggest. In other words, he knows there's a very good chance he's going to be overruled. And this starting and stopping and starting and stopping is worse than just stopping it for a while. Even this judge admits that. But this thing is not over. But it just, again, shows you how important it is that we have judges who actually believe in enforcing the law as written and ruling on the Constitution as written instead of making it up as they go. Wow. Wow. Hey, you want your kid to really become the best he can become? Wait till you hear what the pediatricians are telling you to do now. My name is Greg Knappen for Chad Benson, Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. in thoughts and punk rock in life it's the chad benson show hey how you doing my name is greg knapp i'm in for chad on the chad benson show you can be part of the program as well 844 dig chad to give me your opinion 
and let everybody hear what you think. 844-DIG-CHAD. Also, thechadshow.com. And you can go to Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter right there on the right-hand side of the page. You click the icon, and you can chat that way as well. I've got a story today that just makes total common sense to me, and it's probably why it'll be ignored. Yeah. What do parents care the most about? Their children. And what do they want to do? They want to give their kid a leg up. They want to give them the opportunity to to reach higher and go farther than they ever went in their lives. They want the next generation to pick up the baton and carry it on. They want to stand on the shoulders of giants and reach new heights. And so what do we do? Well, we got to get the kid in the right school. We got to make sure that they're doing all their homework. We've got to make sure that they're in every AP class they can and every honors course they can. And they've got to learn Chinese and Spanish. And they've got to, they've got to learn calculus before they're in 10th grade. And, you know, uh, and, and oh, and we might, might want to get them into a sports team, but not just let them play around the neighborhood. I mean, we've got to have them in one of those travel teams. And we've got to see if they could be a future NFL, NBA, or Major League Baseball star. We've we got to do something. We can't just sit around. And by the way, we're so busy with our jobs because we've got to make a lot of money that when we get home, we just give the kid an iPad or a Mac or the TV and, hey, it's time to go to sleep. Sound familiar? Well, some pediatricians have noticed this problem. And there's a great piece of the L.A. Times. It says, here's the doctor's orders. Give him a drug. What? Yeah. Imagine a drug that could enhance a child's creativity, critical thinking, and resilience. Imagine the drug is safe to take. You can get it for free. It's called play. Play? Yeah, you know the thing that you did when you were a little kid? You'd play with your Legos or blocks or you'd go outside and run and make up a game with your friend or maybe even when you were little... Your mom and dad would play with you. You know, I mean, that's kind of cool. Or or you were big into pretend, and you'd build a fort in your backyard, or whatever it was, but you were just out there. I, in, in my life before radio, I was a mental health counselor, and I specialized in children's behavior, in children's behavior for a while. And so in some of the books I was reading, books like by people like Jean Piaget, famous French child behaviorist, and... One of his most famous quotes, if you want to allow your child to grow and thrive, let them run and play in the park. Let them run and play in the park. But what do we do? We're, we're helicopter parents or we're total with the parents that totally ignore our kid and just put them in front of a screen. And unfortunately, it's taken its toll. So now we got the Harvard Medical School. Pediatrician Dr. Michael Yugman coming out and saying, this may seem old-fashioned, but there are skills to be learned when kids aren't told what to do. <gasps> you mean just letting kids figure it out? Let them go out there and make up their own game? Instead of having a referee and coaches and volunteer parents and you know scoreboards and everything else, just actually let the kids run out in the backyard and play pickup? Yeah, play. Whether it's rough and tumble physical play, outdoor play, or social or pretend play, kids derive important lessons from the chance to make things up as they go. Yep. Couldn't agree more. American Academy of Pediatrics now saying your kid needs to play more. Too much time with apps. Too much time in front of screens. Too much time with a scheduled program from their parents. Just let them play. Or better yet, play with them, especially when they're young. But a lot of parents will say, oh, no, I can't do that. No, because my neighbor's kid is in that special uh, Mandarin Chinese class. And my other neighbor's kid is already taking violin lessons three hours a day. And my other neighbor's kid is in seven AP courses in one year. Yeah, that's what we're doing to our kids. You know, we used to look at the Japanese and go, man, they're way overworking their kids. No, no wonder they got such a suicide and depression problem over there. And now we're doing it. When parents engage and play with their children, it deepens relationships and builds a bulwark against the toxic effects of all kinds of stress, including poverty. That's what the Academy is telling us. American Academy of Pediatrics. Every life skill that's valued in adults can be built up 
with play. We're talking about collaboration, negotiation, conflict resolution, self-advocacy, decision-making, a sense of agency, creativity, leadership, increased physical activity. These are all things that come from play. You know what else? Dealing with bullies. Instead of us worrying about, oh, our kid might be bullied, (laughs) they called him a name. Greg, are you trying to minimize bullying? What I'm trying to say is if you allow your kid to deal with bullying at a young age because he's out there playing with other kids and he's not supervised every second of the day, he won't be bullied as much as he grows up because he knows how to handle the bullies. Sometimes you've got to handle a bully. That's real life. And sometimes you got to handle, I was picked last. So? Go show them that you don't need to be picked last. Get better at the sport. Do something else. And we'll run it home to cry to mama. Oh, how dare you? Don't you know how much that can hurt a kid? You know how much you can help a kid if the kid realizes how to deal with that at an early age. Yeah, it's stressful. But so is everything else we're doing to these kids. So what what did the Academy of uh, American Academy of Pediatrics say is the problem here? Yep. Escalating academic demands at school, more and more digital media, parents loading up their kids' schedules with organized activities, and then the ones who just don't want really to spend any time with their kids. Now, some people, some adults, don't want to spend time with their children. Some are too busy to spend time with their children, and you got to look at that. And some are too stressed to play with their children. None of those are good, and it's all hurting us. There's a study between 81 and 97, 1981 and 1997, showed that the time children spend at play has gone down by 25%, and that's way out of date. I'm sure it's more than that now. Then you've got all the updates in schools. Standardized tests, more homework, more AP courses. A study of L.A. kindergarten that came out in 2009 found that five-year-olds, five-year-olds in kindergarten, so much academics going on in the class, they were down to an average of just 19 minutes per day of free play time. 19 minutes. One in four L.A. teachers say there's no free time at all in their kindergarten class. 30% of U.S. kindergarten classes do not even have recess. That was my favorite part of school. Jean Piaget, if you want your child to grow and thrive, let him run and play in the park. That's a loose paraphrase of his quote because I'm doing it out of my head. Kids in play-based kindergartens actually end up equally good or better at reading and other intellectual schools, skills, excuse me, and are more likely to become well-adjusted people. That's a study that came out in 2009. How about that? You let your kid play, and he's going to turn out better then when you try to overschedule every minute of the day and put them in every academic course you can think of and make them do homework all the time. Kids right now are going, I love this guy. I want this guy on the radio every day. Parents are going, whoa, man, hold on. I can't, I can't let my kid fall behind. Here's another one, Common Sense Media. They said children up through age eight spend an average of two hours and 19 minutes a day in front of screens. Kids under two, an average of 42 minutes a day in front of screens. Hey, look, I understand. I'm a parent. I get it when you're busy. And I get it when your two-year-old is just driving you nuts and you're like, here, watch Barney. But this stuff comes at a cost. comes at a cost. Kids need make-believe. They need face-to-face time with other kids. They need face-to-face time with their parents. They need more time playing. And I know a lot of parents aren't going to want to hear this, and they're worried that if they actually follow this advice and let their kids back off a little bit, that... Their kid's going to fall behind. But it's the exact opposite. And there's also this thing, what is your life really about? Is your life really about taking every AP course you can, you can, going to school eight hours a day, and then doing another eight hours of homework when you come home? Or is it about living a well-rounded life? I mean, we need to back off our kids a little bit. What do you think? 844-DIG-CHAD, get you on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAD. I told you uh, last week about the whole Andrew Cuomo situation where he came out and said, you know, America was never that great. And then last Friday, he changed that as, oh, no, no, uh, yeah, I, I was inartful in that. And of course, America is great. Of course, America has always been great. And I said, let me translate that for you. 
he did some polling and he found out that a majority of Americans and a majority of New Yorkers disagree with him because he's running for another term as governor of New York. And of course, that means Republicans and Democrats he needs the votes of to win. Well, here it is. Rasmussen has the survey out now. Rasmussen reports shows that not not that many people approved of Cuomo saying America was never that great. 67% of likely voters disagreed with his statement. 67%. That ain't good. Only 17% agreed with Cuomo. 16% were undecided. How can you be undecided about that? I'm still thinking. I'm just being undecided doesn't mean that I'm someone who can't decide. It just means I'm still thinking right now. And I'll decide later. You realize not deciding is also deciding. You're deciding not to decide. You're choosing not to choose. Not choosing is a choice. You're confusing me. So 67 people, 67% of likely voters disagreeing with Cuomo that America was never that great. Yeah, that's why I had to back off. It's all about the polls, baby. It's all about the polls. 844 Dig Chad gets you on board. Do you think you should have the right to videotape the police? Well, in public, of course. How about at the police station? Well, I got a story on that one for you in just a second. And Al Sharpton has a little trouble spelling. We'll get all that to you in a minute. My name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad Benson on the Chad Benson Show. No fake outrage here. Just the real thing. The Chad Benson Show. Hey, how you doing? My name is Greg Knapp, in for Chad Benson on the Chad Benson Show. 844-DIG-CHAD, and you're on board. 844-DIG-CHAD. I think the New York Police Department is messing up. You see this story from the New York Post? The police now are saying you can no longer videotape inside the station house. Well, of course not, Greg. I mean, why should you be allowed to videotape inside the station house? Well, there's a few reasons. Number one, the what started this was an event where a, a guy was yelling at the police. It was a really kind of out there rant in the 28th precinct, and it was inside the upper Manhattan station house. So after that was done, they came out with these new guidelines, rules, and it says this from the post. Anyone videotaping inside these facilities will first be asked to stop recording, according to the memo released on Wednesday and citing a recent update to the department's patrol guide. If a person won't stop recording, they will be asked to leave, and those who still refuse can be arrested. Okay, so wait a second. So if I, if, if I go into the police station, in the public area of the police station, haven't been arrested and taken back, and I see something crazy going on, and I take out my phone to start videotaping it, if I don't stop it, they can arrest me? Well, yeah, you're, you're in our station house now. We get to tell you what to do. Okay, but let's think about this, though, for a second. From a public relations standpoint and from just a common sense standpoint, why wouldn't you want it to be videotaped? I mean, I would want it to be videotaped if I'm the police officer. See, if, if I'm a police officer, I want a body camera. I don't want to be on patrol without a body camera and a dashboard camera because that's going to help me. As long as I do what I was trained to do, it'll prove that I'm doing my job the right way. And if somebody tries to lie about me that I uh, assaulted them or I abused them or there was police brutality or I said something horrible to them, all we have to do is go to my body cam and say, nope, there's the tape. I would think it would help me. And, and, of course, the other side of it is that it helps us catch the bad cops. So it keeps the cops honest, and it keeps the suspects honest. Because we now we have video and audio tape to show it. So why not inside, too? I mean, what this tape showed was that this guy was yelling at the officers and saying some pretty grotesque stuff, threatening to sexually assault one of the female officers, you know, cussing. It's good that there's a videotape of that to show what this person was doing. So why wouldn't you allow that to happen? And of course, you can also throw in the whole thing. Wait, this is this is the public building paid for by who paid for by us. 
So why shouldn't we be allowed to videotape something in there that's in the public part of the building? What do you think? I, I think it's a mistake by the New York Police Department. I think they should work on it. And, oh, did you... Al Sharpton has quite a show. Al Sharpton... I didn't even know Al Sharpton still had the show until I saw this today. Because I don't I don't watch his show, evidently. Uh, MSNBC has P- Politics Nation. It's hosted by Reverend Al Sharpton. And he went after Donald Trump for calling Omarosa a dog. You know, Trump tweeted out the whole dog insult. And Trump loves to call people dogs when he's mad at them. Sharpton called it an animalistic slur. And he said, you know, I think you might have learned the lesson this week. Sometimes the dog bites back with a book deal. So Sharpton went on and he, he started talking about his friend Aretha Franklin and her hit song. Let's hear how Sharpton ended this with cut eight. So in the words of my late friend Aretha Franklin, show some R-E-S-P-I-C-T. Wait, wait, what? Play that again? What? So in the words of my late friend Aretha Franklin, show some R-E-S-P-I-C-T. Respect? I mean, that's how she's saying it. R-E-S-P-I-C-T. Find out I can't spell C-C. Oh, come on. I. It was just a slip of the tongue. I mean, Al doesn't make those mistakes. Do we have some more for Al? Or whether we have more to go to build a movement of resistance. But resist, we much. We must and we will much about that be committed. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ah, uh, uh, one more time for his Aretha Franklin friend. What was that word? Was so, in the about? words of my late friend Aretha Franklin, show some R E S P I C T, and then resist. We much, much. Or whether we have we, more to go to build a movement of resistance. Yes. But resist, we much. We must, and we will much about that. Be committed. TV is hard. Teleprompters are hard. Have you read a teleprompter lately? Leave Al alone. Leave Al alone. 844 Dig Chad for you to get on board the program. 844 Dig Chad, thechadshow.com online. And we're going to talk about Brennan's security clearance. We've got an update on it now. And what some of these other intelligence people are now saying about Brennan's behavior as well. My name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad Benson on the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. in thoughts and punk rock in life it's the chad benson show she was a reality tv star hey how you doing my name is greg knapp i'm in for chad on the chad benson show 844 dig chad get you on board 844 dig chad you can also go to the chad show.com click on the facebook the twitter or the instagram icons and you're instantly in and you can chat with chad when you know whenever he actually checks those because he's on vacation right now (laughs) But I'm sure he will. 844 Dick Chad and you're in. Let me start with President Trump going off on this Russian investigation on the media and, and maybe some reasons that he gets this upset about this stuff. And tell me what you think. So here's a little bit from his Twitter feed, right? At real Donald Trump. Disgraced and discredited Bob Mueller and his whole group of angry Democrat thugs spent over 30 hours with the White House counsel, only with my approval for purposes of transparency. Anybody needing that much time when they know there is no Russian collusion is just someone looking for trouble. Now, here's what he's talking about. He had his presidential lawyer, not his personal lawyer, but his presidential lawyer, McGahn, spend 30 hours with the Mueller people. 
Trump waived executive privilege. He waived attorney-client privilege. And 30 hours spent. Now, the New York Times was trying to spin this as, ha, ah, McGahn probably flipped on Trump. No, he went there with Trump's blessing to try to get this stuff taken care of. And Andrew McCarthy, former federal prosecutor, says this is virtually unprecedented to have this much time with the president's attorney and to have both executive privilege and attorney-client privilege waged. Really, Mueller shouldn't even ask Trump for an interview anymore. And if he's thinking about it, he better be able to, one, show that the president is implicated in a serious crime, and two, that he has information or evidence that the prosecutor is unable to obtain from any other source. But he hasn't proved either one of those, and he's had 30 hours with the president's attorney. Trump goes on. They are enjoying ruining people's lives and refuse to look at the real corruption on the Democratic side. And what he's talking about there, of course, is, wait a second, we, we have a dossier by a foreign agent, which would be Steele, the British guy, getting his information from Russian agents who are still unidentified, through second and third tier hearsay. And it's paid for by the presidential candidate of the opposing party of President Trump at the time, candidate Trump. And it's used to get a FISA warrant to look into Trump people. And that's not a problem. It's a good point, isn't it? I mean, wow. He goes on. The lies, the firings, the deleted emails, and so much more. Mueller's angry Dems are looking to impact the election. They are a national disgrace. He continues at Real Donald Trump. Where's the collusion? They made up a phony crime called collusion. And when there was no collusion, they say there was obstruction of a phony crime that never existed. If you fight back or say anything bad about the rigged witch hunt, they scream obstruction. Another one. The failing New York Times wrote a story that made it seem like the White House counsel had turned on the president, when in fact it was just the opposite. And the two fake reporters knew this. This is why the fake news media has become the enemy of the people. So bad for America. How dare Trump say anything like that? I mean, why would you ever say that about the media? Well, here's a piece from MSNBC's Meet the Press on Friday. And it was real clear politics reporter Caitlin Huey Burns. It was John Potters from Potters, excuse me, from the New York Post. It was New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg, and it was host Katie Turr. And so we have Caitlin Huey Burns talking about Trump being the leader of the free world, to which the New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg jumps in and says, he's not the leader of the free world. Sorry. Well, she responds by default, he's the leader of the free world. And, and and she goes, no, Angela Merkel is the leader of the free world. Well, he's the most important person in the world in politics right now, says Huey Burns. But then, then it gets a little bit twisted. Here's the New York Times columnist, Michelle Goldberg, explaining why Trump is not really the leader of the free world, as most U.S. presidents have been called, cut seven. He's, right. a, he's a sort of junior player in a block of authoritarian countries. And no, and the people like the European Union are no longer looking at him as a leader any longer. And they're thinking of, of course not. Thing. They see That's him as, right, they see he's instead, he's like, right, he's part of a block that includes Vladimir Putin, Duterte. He's, you know, he's kind of part so, of a, he, he's part of kind of an axis power. That's, of well, thought. hold on. That's, that's worse. Uh, it's, that's, it's worse than that him, in a certain I mean, way. I mean, not that that's not the worst thing you could have said, because it's about <laughs> the worst thing you could say about him. But well, if he's, he's not, not he's rounding people up and murdering America. murdering them yeah. without any, uh, you know, yeah. due process. He'd certainly yeah. like to. Uh, what? Uh, well, anyway, I, I, I what? Okay, so first of all, you have the New York Times columnist comparing President Trump to being part of a block that includes Vladimir Putin and Duterte from the Philippines. They're murderers. They're people who murder their own people. They are authoritarians. They have people rounded up who disagree with them. When, where has Trump done that? Wh what reporter has been put in prison? Which news network has been taken off the air? Which enemy of Trump has been poisoned? I mean, these people are nuts. And, and then you got uh, Potters over there from the New York Post saying it's worse than that. 
How can it be worse than that? So th- then Katie Turr even goes, oh, okay, now hang on a second. Trump is not rounding people up and murdering them without any due process, as if it would be okay. <laughs> and, 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 and the New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg says he would certainly like to. How do you get a fair shake from this columnist exactly? Could you imagine if someone had said that about Obama? Now, it is absolutely arguable that President Obama violated his oath of office in taking on more power than the executive branch is supposed to have, way more than President Trump has. Nobody said that about Obama. Well, it's different. You just you know, like he would certainly like to. He would like to round people up and murder them. I mean, that's what she said on national television, and no problem. Sure, she can say that. Nothing to worry about. Well, of course she can say it. She's a First Amendment right. But I'm saying, shouldn't there be some blowback on that? And then we move on to what John Brennan has been saying. Because John Brennan has been saying some pretty crazy things about Trump for quite a while. And you remember when he went to Russia, you had Brennan tweeting out that it was treasonous behavior. Donald Trump's press conference performance in Helsinki, sorry, it was in Helsinki, but with Vladimir Putin, rises to and exceeds the threshold of high crimes and misdemeanors. It was nothing short of treasonous. So so here's the former CIA director accusing the president of treason, right? And now we've even got people, former intelligence people, saying Brennan crossed the line. Growing number of top intelligence community veterans from the Obama era calling out ex-CIA director John Brennan. Daniel Hoffman served as CIA station chief in Moscow during the Obama administration. And he was on Fox News. This is an Obama guy. He was on Fox News. He said, intelligence officers speculate really at our own risk, at their own peril. We shouldn't be doing that. We deal in facts. We read the facts, the intelligence, and then we make the judgments. And John Brennan with an emotional outburst, is speculating and is not dealing with the facts. Wow. Retired Admiral Michael Mullen said, I think John's an extraordinary servant of the country, but I think he has been incredibly critical of the president, and I think that has put him in a political place which actually does more damage for the intelligence community, which is apolitical. He was asked on CNN's State of the Union if he thinks Brennan's attacks on Trump are an issue. Then you had... Former director of national intelligence, James Clapper, replying, I think it is. And I got that audio for you in a second. And and I like how, uh, again, Andrew McCarthy, former federal prosecutor, points out that even though he's not really excited about how Trump pulled his security clearance because he thinks it, it is politicized, he's even more upset that Brennan politicized intelligence and he did deserve to have it pulled said, I think it's a big mistake to politicize the revocation of security clearances. But I'm even less of a fan of the politicization of intelligence itself. And that justifies the revocation of Brennan's clearance. Because but besides his outrageous tweets about how much he obviously hates Trump, Brennan speaks with a nod and a wink, the undercurrent of which is that if he could only tell you the secrets he knows, you demand Trump's impeachment forthwith indeed undercurrent is probably the wrong word writes mccarthy brennan after all has expressly asserted that our treasonous president is wholly in the pocket of putin and has exceeded the threshold of high crimes and misdemeanors but there you know beyond that just being outrageous there are ongoing investigations and trials right now and brennan's own role in the investigation of the trump campaign is under scrutiny He was part of Obama's intelligence apparatus that really misused intelligence to go after a FISA warrant. Wow. Okay. So you've got you've got what the media is doing and you've got what some of these former intelligence officials are doing. And now even some of the former intelligence officials are saying, you know what, really shouldn't be doing this. And now you've got Brennan, the CIA director that accused Trump of committing treason kind of flip-flopping on that statement got all that for you in just a second 
Uh, my name is Greg Knapp, 844-DIG-CHAT if you want to get in on this. That audio is coming right up, 844-DIG-CHAT. My name is Greg Knapp, in for Chad Benson on The Chad Benson Show. Deep states? Uh, no. Deep doo-doo? Yeah. The Chad Benson Show. My name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad. On the Chad Benson Show, you can jump in as well, 844-DIG-CHAT, 844-DIG-CHAT. And we're talking about the former CIA director, John Brennan, accusing President Trump of treason, but also with a wink and a nod acting like, you know, hey, listen, I have access to the security stuff. And if you knew what I knew, you would know just how just how deep Trump is in this Russian collusion stuff. That's the kind of implication he gives in some of his tweets and some of his appearances. And he's politicized intelligence. And he's up to his neck in what happened with the whole investigation into uh, Trump to begin with. The old Obama intelligence apparatus. And, and what were they doing with the Steele dossier and, and the spying on the Trump people? And I mean, there's a huge story there that still has to be totally undone. But Brennan's flip-flopped now on those treasonous remarks. He was on Friday night. He was on with Rachel Maddow, and she asked him about his treason remark. Listen to this. And I did say that it rises to and exceeds the level of uh, uh, high crimes and misdemeanors and is nothing short of treasonous. I didn't mean that he committed treason, but it was a term that I used, nothing short of treasonous. Well, you didn't mean that he committed treason, though. I said it's nothing short of treasonous. That was the term that I used, yeah. Wait, so, but wait, if it's nothing short of treasonous, then it is treason, right? I mean, that's what it means. That's what the language means. If it's nothing short of treasonous, then you were saying he committed treason. But it seemed like he was kind of backtracking. But then yesterday on NBC's Meet the Press, he doubled down. Chuck Todd asked him, do you regret essentially accusing the president of treason? I called his behavior treasonous, which is to portray one's trust and to aid and abet the enemy. And I stand very much by that claim of his actions. Todd says, the former CIA director accusing the sitting president of the United States of treason. That's a monumental accusation. Brennan, well, I think these are abnormal times. And I think a, a lot of people have spoken out against what Mr. Trump has done. And maybe it's my warning. Training as an intelligence professional. I've seen the lights blinking red in terms of what Mr. Trump has done and is doing and bringing this country down the global stage. See, it's again the wink and the nod. I've seen. I know stuff. I've got the security clearance. I've seen what he's doing, feeding divisiveness of our country. I don't believe I'm being political at all. <laughs> I don't believe I'm being political at all. I'm not a Republican. I am not a Democrat. I'm a communist. He didn't say that last part. <laughs> no, but he did admit that he voted for communist for president in 1976. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I know you're a communist. No, that's how dare. What are you, McCarthy? Have you no shame, sir? This guy is actually trying to say he doesn't believe he's political. I think he's trying to save his own butt right now is what he's trying to do, because I think if we really knew what happened with the former Obama administration officials, with the Hillary Clinton emails, and with the Steele dossier, and the investigation in the Trump administration, and investigation into Americans, which they weren't supposed to be doing, and, and what they didn't tell the FISA court as they tried to get those FISA warrants, that, oh, by the way, this is funded by the opposing presidential candidate, that he's trying to cover his own backside. And even, even former DNI guy, James Clapper, was asked by Jake Tapper if he thought Brennan's criticisms of Trump were becoming a problem. Quote, do you think that John Brennan's hyperbole about treason is an issue here? Is one of the issues we're having this crisis? Here's what Clapper said. Cut five. I think it is. Uh, I think, um, you know, John uh, is, is sort of like a freight train and uh, he's going to say what's on his mind. Subtle like a freight train. So even Clapper thinks the hyperbole is getting out of control. He went on. Cut six. The common denominator among all of us that have been speaking up, though, is genuine concern about the jeopardy or threats to institutions and values. And although we may express that in, in, in different ways, and I think that's what this, this really is about. But John and, and his rhetoric have become, uh, I think, an issue in and of itself. Yeah, they have. And listen, I have no problem with people criticizing the president. I want them to criticize the president, no matter who the president is. 
The problem is when you then start politicizing intelligence. And the problem is when you act like somehow there's there's never a time when you should lose your security clearance. Come on. And and when you seem to be so hyper partisan in a job that's supposed to be not political. And then you act like you're not. You actually say you're not. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not political. I'm just a communist. And then he, he comes out and says that he's ready to sue. Yes, he's considering taking Trump to court. I'm going to do whatever I can personally to try to prevent these abuses in the future. And if it means going to court, I will do that. Rudy Giuliani said, oh, yeah, I would volunteer to do that case for, for the president. I would love to have Brennan under oath. We will find out about Brennan and we will find out what a terrible job he did. In fact, he went on to tweet out to Brennan, to John Brennan. Today, President Trump granted our request to handle your case. After threatening, if you don't, it would be just like Obama's red lines. Come on, John. You're not a blowhard. Oh, (laughs) my name's Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad Benson on the Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. Independent in thought and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. And my name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD, and you're a part of the broadcast. Just wrapping this up on the Trump updates, Reuters now has out a new story that says that President Trump is worried that Mueller is setting a perjury trap for him. What? How, how could you ever have a perjury trap? All you got to do is tell the truth. Really tell that to Michael Flynn. Well, what do you mean? I'll get to that in a second. Michael Flynn. So it says that President Trump said today he's worried any statements under oath that he provides to Mueller could be used to bring perjury charges against him. That he's worried about a perjury trap. That investigators could compare his statements with that of others who have testified in the probe, such as James Comey, and any discrepancies would be used against him. He said, quote, even if I'm telling the truth, that makes me a liar. That's no good. Now, so Trump still didn't say whether he would ultimately uh, uh, say, yes, I'll go ahead and be interviewed by Mueller. He also declined to say whether he might take away Mueller's security clearance. Well, I like this piece that was written by John Lott Jr. I mean, excuse me, John. Yeah, John Lott Jr. Over on the Fox News website, because everybody went nuts. on Giuliani's comments on Meet the Press that, quote, Truth isn't truth because, you know, that's just a great line. I mean, you can just take that where Giuliani said, uh, when you tell me that, you know, he should testify because he's going to tell the truth and he shouldn't worry. Well, that's so silly because it's somebody's version of the truth, not the truth to which Chuck Todd said, truth is truth. And Giuliani said, no, it isn't truth. Truth isn't truth. Oh, man, you're never going to win when you say truth isn't truth. (laughs) Right. He goes, truth isn't truth. You know, the president of the United States says I didn't. And then Chuck Todd jumps in. Truth isn't truth. Mr. Mayor, do you realize? And Giuliani goes, no, 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 no. Don't do this to me. And Todd says, don't do truth isn't truth to me. But Giuliani said this. If the president says I didn't do it and James Comey says he did do it, then who's telling the truth? That's the point he was trying to make. But you don't get to that point when you see people ripping on what Giuliani said. Now, I think Giuliani could have said it better but what he's trying to say is there is such thing as a perjury trap case in point did you see what happened to former national security advisor michael flynn he was charged last year with perjury you know why he got a date wrong in an interview with fbi agents now flynn hadn't even been told the purpose of the interview he hadn't been given a chance to refresh his memory on the dates and and get this now this is the part that's almost never talked about in mainstream media As John Lott points out, the FBI agents who interviewed Flynn did not think Flynn lied. They believed he simply made a mistake on the dates. They found, quote, no physical indications of deception and, quote, didn't see any change in posture, in tone, in inflection, in eye contact, end quote. 
and yet he's still been ch- charged with lying to investigators. Making a mistake like that is not the same thing as lying, Lot points out. This happens all the time with witnesses. But perjury charges were not brought against Flynn until Special Prosecutor Mueller's investigation of Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election got underway months later in 2017. See, Mueller has never even alleged that Flynn perjured himself in an attempt to cover up some of the crime. They just were hoping to flip Flynn against Trump. And this happens. Unfortunately, we have federal prosecutors who are willing to bring the entire weight and power and money and virtually unlimited resources of our country against somebody. And they will find something. Is that really what we want? Because that's what we've got right now. And yes, there is such a thing as a perjury trap. 844-DIG-CHAT, get you on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAT. Have you been following the Me Too movement? Hashtag Me Too. Thankfully, it's called a hashtag now instead of the pound sign, because then it would be, you know, pound Me Too. Hashtag Me Too. One of the people that first jumped in against Harvey Weinstein is the Italian actress Asia Argento. And now she's being accused of hypocrisy. Because actor Jimmy Bennett, who played her son in the film The Heart is Deceitful Above All Things back in 2004, is accusing her of sexually assaulting him when he was 17 and she was 37. And he filed a notice of intent to sue in 2017 for $3.5 million in damages. The accusation is for intentional infliction of emotional distress, lost wages, assault, and battery. He said what happened was that she had invited him to his hotel room. He had come with a with another uh, person with him. She had asked for that person to, to leave the room. And then she gave him alcohol and committed sexual acts with him. So he was going to sue for $3.5 million in damages. She settled the suit for $380,000. Now, in the state of California, the age of consent is 18. So back in 2013, when he was only 17, he is accusing her of sexual assault against him. Wow. Now... She accused Harvey Weinstein of sexually assaulting her and has been a huge part of the Me Too movement. Now we're finding out that, according to the L.A. Times, there are detectives looking into these allegations that this actress, Asia Argento, sexually abused a teen actor when he was 17. Because that's against the law. Whoa, it's pursuing the matter by trying to interview the parties involved. And then we move on to Asia Argento's career. She's been part of X Factor Italy. You know that show X Factor where you have the people come on and and if they have uh, a talent, you let them stay. If they stink, you, you, you put the X's up. They're saying that if the assault claim is confirmed, she will be cut from the show. Hashtag me too. What do you think? 844 844- Dig Chad gets you on board the program, 844 Dig Chad. And here's here's what I think is a great story, but I know there are already people saying, ew, and people saying she had no right to do it. Uh, a story out of Argentina. It's a police officer. Her name is Celeste Jacqueline Ayala, and she was working guard duty at a children's hospital in Buenos Aires. And, and, a, and a little baby looks to be maybe... I don't know, eight, nine months old, was brought in. And the baby was neglected and malnourished and smelly and dirty. And immediately when he was brought in, the officer asked to hold the baby and she started breastfeeding him. Wait, what? 
Evidently, she is breastfeeding right now. She has children of her own. She saw this baby. She took great compassion on the baby, and she just whipped it out and started breastfeeding right there in the hospital hallway because the child wasn't malnourished. I think it's an unbelievable act of compassion. What a, a, a witness was there, took a photo of it, put it up on Facebook, and said, I want to make public this great gesture of love that you had today with that little baby, who, without knowing you, you didn't hesitate and for a moment, and you fulfilled as if you were her mother. This is translated from Spanish, so whoever translated it was having trouble. You don't care about filth and smell. Things like that don't happen every day. Now, the officer said she didn't think twice about it. She was just helping the baby in need. I noticed that he was hungry. He was putting his hand in his mouth. I asked to hug him and breastfeed him. It was a sad moment. It broke my soul seeing him like this. Society should be sensitive to the issues affecting children. It cannot keep happening. Is is there anybody that thinks she was wrong in this? I, I You know, you can always find somebody. I, well, you know, the what if what if that, that baby maybe it was... Something wrong with the inf- maybe there's some infected milk in there. Maybe the maybe the woman has a disease that she's passing on through the maybe that she saw a baby in need and she fed it. I think it's pretty great. And on the opposite side of the coin, oh man, have you see, you've seen what's been going on in Venezuela? Millions fleeing the country, and v- Venezuela is getting tired of it, and it's starting to get violent. This is out of the BBC today. Brazil deploying troops because there were attacks on the migrant camps. There's a border town there, Pacarema, and the Venezuelan migrant camps were attacked and set afire. Whoa. Uh, In Ecuador, desperate Venezuelans were also reported to be crossing the border in defiance of the new entry requirements. Now, wait a second. I thought America was horrible for having our immigration laws. I mean, we're the worst country in the world, even though we take in, you know, upwards of almost 2 million a year. We're horrible. And especially, how could we even question people and their refugee status? Even though, of course, we just found last week, we let a guy in from Iraq who ended up being a guy accused of murdering an Iraqi police officer and part of al-Qaeda in Iraq because we simply believed him saying, no, he wasn't. But here we have Ecuador and Brazil, and they're putting really tight requirements on allowing Venezuelans in when we know they're fleeing starvation. And the horrible, horrible situation in that country. And we've got Brazil burning migrant encampments. In Pacarema on Saturday, several migrant encampments were attacked by angry residents following reports that a local restaurant owner had been va- badly beaten by Venezuelans. Been growing animosity towards the number of Venezuelan migrants entering the state in recent months. Gee, I can't have, Why would people get worried about that? Why? Because this, this stuff can't go on forever. I, eventually, people are going to get tired of it. But Venezuela, I mean, it, it would work if, if it's just that Venezuela isn't doing socialism correctly. I mean, sure, they have to eat zoo animals to stay alive right now. Sure, the average adult has lost 25 pounds in the last year. Sure, a couple million people have fled the country. Sure, inflation, you know, is to the point they had to knock five zeros off the end of the, the, the dollar, uh, uh, off, off their dollar. Sure, all that's going on devaluing currency by 95 percent they're having to freeze prices as if that's going to fix it but you know it's just because they're not doing socialism correctly it's really probably america's fault i'm sure (laughs) it's our fault 844 dig chad get you on board my name's greg knapp in for chad benson on the chad benson show Me too. Hashtag immigration reforms. Hashtag help. I'm trapped in a hashtag factory and I can't get out. The Chad Benson Show. So in the words of my late friend Aretha Franklin, show some R-E-S-P-I-C-T. Thank you, Al. We'll continue to work on our respect because we know how important that is to you. 
and you just continue to work on the teleprompter. Well, wait, there was one other problem with the teleprompter not too long ago on his show, wasn't it? Do you still have that? Or whether we have more to go to build a movement of resistance, but resist we much. We must and we will much about that be committed. TV is hard. TV's hard, man. 844 Dig Chat if you want to jump in. My name's Greg Knapp in for chat on the Chad Benson Show. You can get in as well, thechadshow.com, and you can check out his Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. Two of my favorite bands slash entertainer were in a pitched battle. So, and I like both of these albums, so it's hard for me to get too excited. But did you see the latest review of album sales? Shows that Thriller by Michael Jackson is no longer the best-selling album of all time. It is now the Eagles' greatest hits album. Okay, now I got some problems. Okay, let's just get down to the details first of all. All right, so the Eagles' greatest hits album, which I own both one and two, is now the number one selling album of all time. The greatest hits, 1971 to 1975, is now 38 times platinum. That means 38 million sales. That's including real album sales and streams. And they have this calculation where you have to have so many streams to equal an album sale and so many downloads to equal an album sale. And so they figure all that out. And so now 38 million for the Eagles Greatest Hits album, 1971 to 1975. Well, it was released in 1976, so there's the first problem. Okay, that album was released in 76. Thriller was released in November of 82. I have that album, too. Well, I have it on cassette because, you know, I used to have cassettes. I know. I'm Kids, let me tell you about cassettes and how we used to use cassettes. All right, so I, I got both of them. They're both awesome. But that means that you've got, you know, from 1976 to 1982, that the greatest hits were on sale and Thriller wasn't even on sale yet. So that doesn't seem too fair. Then you throw in the fact that for the Eagles, it's a greatest hits album and Thriller was an original. Every song on there is an original, not a greatest hits deal. But I still like both of them, so I'm I'm not going to get too excited about it. But they don't look at these. Uh, they don't tally all the sales for these albums every year. And the last time that they looked at the sales for the Eagles' Greatest Hits album was 2006. It was only 29 times platinum. And the sales and streams for Thriller were last updated last year. So now when they do them all, they're able to see that the Eagles' Greatest Hits has now passed Thriller. So which one do you think was better? Eagles' Greatest Hits or Thriller? See, now that's another tough thing because they're totally different genres of music. It's like when people say, what's your favorite song? Well, what do you mean? Because... I've got a favorite song for blues. I got a favorite song for rock. I got a favorite song that's a ballad. I got a favorite song that's pop. I got, and even then, I was like, well, there's different types of music inside those genres. Uh, same thing with movies. I can't do that either. But it tells you an awful lot when you have sold 38 million copies of an album. 844 Dig Chad gets you on board the program. Chelsea Clinton back in the news. You know, people keep asking her if she's going to run, which. Really kind of blows my mind. What has Chelsea Clinton really done to be somebody that people are clamoring for her to to run for office, except that her last name is Clinton? I've got a huge problem with this, just like I didn't want Jeb Bush to be the next president. We've had enough Bush's president. We've had enough Clinton's president and, and senator. We... I thought we fought a war to start this country in part because we didn't like royalty telling us what to do. And we wanted taxation with representation. And we wanted, you know, to be able to elect people. Well, you can elect Chelsea or not elect Chelsea. I understand that. I'm simply saying we don't need to set up a, another type of royalty simply based on name recognition. What has she done? I, I don't know. I don't I don't see this great demand for her to run. Oh, and, and they're saying that Hillary Clinton's not done. She's having an intimate fundraiser. Really? Hey, knock yourselves out, Democrats. Run her again. Run her one more time. <laughs> My name's Greg Knapp. In for Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show.
This is the Chad Benson Show.